Good afternoon and welcome to this session of the TRED Association's virtual conference. My name is Chelsea Tolner, Director of Outreach and Education at the TRED Association of America. Thank you for joining us today for improved classroom and homeschool communications. We would like to take this opportunity to thank our conference platinum sponsors, MLX and David Amenson, our diamond sponsor, Oracle, as well as all donors and supporters for making this free conference possible. To help us to continue to provide educational programming, please consider making a donation. Your gifts will help the TAA to continue to provide critical support and resources to the community. Please visit Tourette.org front slash donate to make a contribution today. During today's session, we would love to hear from you and include your voice in the conversation. You can ask questions or share comments using the question panel on the right side of your GoToWebinar player at any time during the presentation. We will collect your questions and address them during the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. It is my pleasure to now introduce you to our presenters, Sue Corey, PhD, and Robin Elliott, EDD. Sue Corey is currently the chair of the Early Childhood Special and General Education Program at Toro Graduate School of Education. Dr. Corey earned her PhD in special education at Vanderbilt University, where she began a line of research on teaching and learning mathematics for children with learning challenges. Prior to taking on her position at, Tor at Toro GSE, Dr. Corey was an associate professor of special education at San Francisco State University and mild slash moderate program coordinator within the Department of Special Education and was awarded Professor Emeritus. Her research interests continue to be in the areas of mathematics and learning challenges, universal design for learning, teacher preparation, autism, and exceptionality. Dr. Corey is currently working on program improvement for teacher preparation. Robin Elliott, EDD, is currently the director of Stanford programs at Long Island University in Brooklyn, New York. Within this role, she supports the training and implementation of Stanford Harmony Social Emotional Learning Program within hundreds of schools and after school organizations in the tri state region. Dr. Elliott provides weekly professional development sessions on social emotional learning and strategies to increase cultural competencies for educators and youth development facilitators. Additionally, she is an adjunct professor in the Graduate School of Education at Toro College in Manhattan, New York. Dr. Elliott has over 26 years of teaching and administration experience in New York City and South Carolina. Prior to her position at Long Island University, she managed Stanford programs at National University and Toro College. She was the founding special education coordinator at Harbor Science and Arts Charter School in East Harlem, New York from 2003 to 2011. Her most recent qualitative research titled Factors That Influence the Retention of Urban Hispanic Male Graduates is in publication. I will now turn it over to Sue and Robin. Thank you, thank you so much, Chelsea. I th hearing all those wonderful things, I, I wondered who you were talking about. I appreciate it. <laughs> and, and thank you everyone for attending our session. Um, as we go through, you know that our session, we are discussing um, effective communication, and that is communication between home and school. And that's not, not just teachers, but all of the services um, available at school. And, and also, we, we will also add in how that has changed in the past three months due to the coronavirus. Uh, communication is, is especially important now. Um, and so we will talk about ways to communicate, the importance of the school family relationship, and we will also talk about different resources for teachers and parents to use to help with, with the social aspects of school and the learning at home. So we start by talking about families because families are defined in many different ways and many different cultures, but mostly it's a mutual support group for a, for a student. Families are, could be extended, they could include friends. And so I say that because it's important when we say the family school partnership that we accept all the individuals who support a particular student. And Robin, feel free to jump in if you wanna add anything. So, so a teacher's role is to be accepting of families. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about what that means. And also understanding that each child with Tourette's or a tick disorder is unique. So we can talk generally about what Tourette 
and tick disorders are, but they, they manifest themselves differently in each individual and the way that each family chooses to address Tourette's. Um, and I can, my, I can explain, I have a 30 year old son who was diagnosed with Tourette's when he was five. And we were very fortunate because not, not every child, who, when they start expressing tics and some of the other behaviors that go with it get diagnosed that quickly. But it, it really did help us because early intervention, like with any, any individual struggle is important. So we were able to address it early on. And now that he's 30, he's married, he's leaving the army after 10 years and he's, he's, got, he's accepted a civilian job. And so I say that because um, he had very good teachers, a good support system and teachers who always had high expectations as, as well as us as parents. And that's another really important um, important sort of fundamental concept that it's you don't see a child with Tourette's often. Some people haven't. Some te new teachers haven't seen a child with Tourette's. In general, a child with Tourette's or a tic disorder, they have average to above average intelligence. Um, they struggle with sometimes ADHD or um, obsessive compulsive disorders. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that and ways to address it, but they are intelligent and with the proper strategies, behavior management and acceptance, they, they thrive. So I'm, I'm not sure how much everybody knows about Tourette's. Um, the most visible aspects, of course, are the vocal tics and the motor tics. But if you look at my, my picture on the screen, you'll see that the ticks are the tip of the iceberg, but you'll see some of the other factors that travel with Tourette's. And they could be rage, uh, behavioral issues, as I mentioned, ADHD, um, executive functioning may be difficult, but there are strategies to help with that, handwriting. Um, and, and the other thing is that these can manifest themselves anywhere along the timeline of the year that you might spend with a student with Tourette's. Um, ticks, they come and go, they wax and wane. Um, levels of ADHD, rage, impulse control, they vary. Both the ticks and the underlying conditions vary with stress factors. These are things to keep in mind. Um, now, my son's 30, so even if he needed an IEP because he didn't have academic problems in school. He would not, but he did. He was covered under 504 when his tics were, were so bad that he, during standardized testing, an occupational therapist had to fill in the little bubbles for him. And I mention that because things change. And when, when he was going in that year into standardized testing, um, his teachers, I, I, this is how supportive they were, and the principal, they, I didn't have to go to a meeting about the, um, the occupational therapist it was taken care of. But if it hadn't been, I knew it was my role to be an advocate for that. Um, so I'm not sure how much you know about Tourette's, but in order to be diagnosed officially with Tourette's, there has to be both motor and vocal tics, and motor tics are different movements of the body, and it could be any part of the body. And then the frequency and severity of the tics, they change over time. So there's different tics, as I mentioned, um, vocal tics, hand shaking is very common, hand to the mouth. Um, there's also, and it's very rare, the outburst of, um, of curse words, uh, but with that comes, with the tics comes, as I said, ADHD, OCD, anxiety, depression, and they play out in different ways in the classroom. So what can a teacher do? I think one of the fundamental things is to really understand that tics, sometimes kids play them off as trying to get attention 
or you think they're trying to get attention, or they don't want to take a math test, or they don't want to take the reading test. But for the most part, tics are involuntary. Their sounds, they wax and wane, and, and they can be controlled for short periods. But often, if a student is suppressing tics, they later come out in a flurry. Um, now, stress and anxiety exacerbate tics. And so that's one thing. When there's an understanding between what the student needs at home, what he needs in the classroom, what his other what other students need to know, then you could see that would reduce stress and reduce some of the tics. Um, another thing I wanted to say, I, I talked about an official diagnosis of Tourette's, but not all students get an official diagnosis of Tourette's in a timely way. And often it, it, it doesn't get diagnosed and it could be years before there's an official diagnosis. That doesn't mean that a child with tics is doing it on purpose. So keep that in mind. So what can we do in the classroom? First of all, we build on a student's strengths. So aside from any of the expression of tics or outbursts, um, every student has strengths. So if this is someone coming into fifth grade, what were the strengths that, what are the strengths that the student is bringing um, with them? And then when you know that, you'll know, well, what is this student struggling with? Could it be ADHD, which, which could mean that they can't attend to tasks or OCD, ADHD and OCD both contribute to difficulty in, in um, executive functioning. And executive functioning is when you have 10 things that you have to get done today, you can organize it and create a timeline in your brain and, and reorganize. But if you struggle with, with, um, with executive management, it, it becomes almost impossible to the cognitive load to hold all the tasks and what required what's required for each task and then to execute all of the tasks it it becomes very very difficult and so we create strategies and i will show you where to find all different strategies for helping with executive functioning time management um behavior management but one thing right off the bat you can do is ignore the symptoms that can be ignored. So this demonstrates that you're accepting of, of a vocal tick or a motor tick, and, but also help the other students in the class understand why this is happening and create a, a sort of safe environment where a student can tick and stay in the classroom in a way that is not stressful. Okay, the other thing is really monitor bullying because bullying goes on all over the school building. And so by helping all the students understand what Tourette's is and how they can be supportive is an important part of a student's success, academic success. The other thing is many Many students struggle with handwriting because of motor tics. So some of the things that you could do is use a computer, a tablet, um, have a note taker, provide guided notes. Um, and, and if there's a written assignment or say spelling words, math problems, does, does the student really have to do 50 words when you, you can assess understanding or spelling ability with 25 words. These are some things to think about. The other thing is those co-occurring co conditions take up both um, thinking and, and time. And so helping students recognize this and be accepting of it is, is much easier than than giving up uh, student consequences for something that they can't control. So, so we can be creative with interventions and we teach lifelong strategies, providing supports, accommodations, modifications, like I said, that, that 
strengthening their ability to self-manage, um, that's much better than consequences. And then involve the student when they're old enough in developing plans and strategies for managing symptoms. Um, have have a, a system for maybe they need 10 minutes to stop and, and reduce the stress level or certain behavior um, management sim, um, behavior management plans in place that help a student with Tourette's, but also help all the students in the class. For example, um, for young children, you, you would wanna from the beginning of the year, you'd wanna have a plan for how everything gets done for the day so that the students know what to do when they walk in the class, when they put their things away, when they line up, when they go to the restroom, when they transition from one subject to another, they know the, the procedures, they practice them with you, then they perform the procedures, might need to review the procedures. In this way, and the rules, procedures and rules that are practiced and um, modeled, practiced, and then revisited, in this way, stress is reduced for all students because they know exactly what they are supposed to do throughout the day. Most kids with or without Tourette's, they don't go to school thinking, I'm coming today to really bother my teacher. Often behavior problems pop up because uh, a student doesn't, isn't sure what to do, doesn't know how to handle when they don't know what to do. So having a behavior management in plan is really important. And I've also put down here a link to the Tourette's Association. There's a, many great resources for teachers there. Um, the other thing I wanna share is um, the, the lives of families who have children with Tourette's can be like a roller coaster. And, and you can imagine because you don't know when the ticks will increase, decrease, um, some of the um, the outburst, um, impulse control. And, and so when you meet a family for the first time and you've only seen a student who's ticking, who could look like a behavior problem, and you meet the family, remember that the family has been possibly trying to get a diagnosis, possibly trying to get treatment, trying to help manage behaviors at home. And so they, they go through so many different issues and the issues change all the time. What will happen when we go to the movies? What will happen when I put him on the bus? What will happen? I was, I was afraid, um, I knew eventually my son would wanna go out with his friends to the movies and take buses by himself. And I was always afraid. And, um, but, but um, so, so try to be understanding and understand the issues that they have. Because the flip side is that parents also are very proud of their child's accomplishments, very proud of how they learn to advocate for themselves, proud that, that, um, that they help you be more accepting of all children. They help you be accepting of, of imperfections and, and differences. So where there are struggles, there, there are also really blessings at the same time. So, so that goes to really respecting families because parents are the ultimate decision makers in the long run, but you wanna be able to make decisions together because teachers are um, sort of in charge of, I don't wanna say in charge of, but manage the content and, and create opportunities for learning and families and offer strategies for learning and behavior. And families too are trying to do a lot of the same, but at home. And so the more communication there is between the classroom and home, for example, if you have a behavior management um, plan in the classroom that really reduces stress and and you um, it, it has been working, you share it with the parents 
so that they can build on those strategies. So um, also there are cultural differences in, in families and, and acceptance of Tourette's. You will have families that will tell you, yeah, my, my relatives don't believe that he has Tourette's or, uh, or um, my relatives are upset and ashamed. I mean, there's a whole gamut of things that families bring with them to the classroom and the more accepting and willingness to listen really helps build a strong communication, which helps both of you, parents and teachers. And like I said, always acknowledge the student's strengths because we want to build off those strengths and maintain high expectations for both students and families. Um, as I said, most, if not all students with Tourette's um, have average to above average intelligence. And so I, I have to say, because none of my son's teachers lowered expectations, there was communication. He graduated from college. He was in the army. Um, he's married. He So this teachers play a really important role in keeping in academic success, keeping kids in school, and preventing bullying. So here's a resource for teachers and parents. This is a website called, uh, it's Iris at Peabody, and it is a plethora of um, modules and learning ideas, managing behavior, collaboration. Now this one I just picked up, this is helping students become independent learners. There's several of them, and I have a link here at the bottom of the PowerPoint that will be shared with you. It's, um, it's very helpful. And just wanna say, let's continue collaboration to maintain relationship and sustain involvement of families and involvement of teachers with families. So I'm gonna turn this over from here on to Robin. Thank you, Robin. Thank you, Sue. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how do we maintain those relationships like Sue was talking about? How do we help our children, um, children with Tourette, self-manage um, those behaviors that she was speaking about? So you may have heard this. This is the buzzword now, even pre-COVID, um, social-emotional learning. What is that? Um, what is SEL? So this is the process. These are the five main competencies that all children need, all adults need. Um, and also, you know, for our children with Tourette's, um, very important for them and for us as educators and to help support the families and helping them with the five social emotional competencies. And those are, like Sue was talking about, managing those emotions really regulating those behaviors and understanding those. The second one also is, you know, setting and achieving positive goals. Work, families working with educators to focus on what are the goals? What do we want our children to, what are the outcomes we want? And that empathy, Sue talked about the bullying. So children that are more empathetic to others are less likely to bully each other. Also those positive relationships positive relationships. Sue mentioned twice that her son is married. He has a healthy, sustainable relationship. That is very important for all of our children and especially for children with Tourette's. How do we help them establish those relationships and maintain those? And the fifth one, making those good choices. There's a lot of things that our children can't control, their behaviors, whether it's Tourette's or tic disorders or just in general, our children that are learning, and, and are growing, um, but also how do we help them and us as educators and with the families work together to make those good choices? So all of that with building positive relationships is having that confidence. How do we help our children build their voice? How do we empower them? that confidence, that's where that compassion comes in. How do we promote the equity? Letting every single child in the classroom or working together, they are included, they are a part of a family, part of a community. 
really enhancing that communication. That is essential for children um, with, with Tourette's and, and helping working together with the families. So the families also, we build the voice and we help our children find their voice, building that confidence. And we'll talk a little bit about how we can do that at home. But the biggest thing is those stereotypes um, Sue mentioned as far as um, there's a stereotype that children with Tourette's that they may blurt out curse words, but it's very rare, like she mentioned. So what are some stereotypes that our children with Tourette's may have? If we build those strong relationships and those friendships with the children, with their peers, with their teachers, we can help them build those connections. But first of all, we have to identify the commonalities. If what did what do they have in common? Our children, um, if if we help them build relationships in the classroom, identify um, Brad likes the New York Knicks and then um, she likes the New York Knicks. So they have something in common. So as educators, helping find those commonalities with all of our children will help build a sense of inclusion, will help them form those connections. And that's when the friendships happen, but it has to be based on a commonality. As you know, we surround ourselves with folks that we have things in common with. So the same thing about our children. So we can break those stereotypes by letting them find out the strengths that our children have. And the first thing is, what do they have in common with each other? So we have to give them that, that conversation and that platform to engage in a conversation. And it looks differently for every child. It looks differently for all of us as well. Um, what, what does a conversation look like? How do we start it? And how do we um, sustain a conversation? So it's very important for our children for us to build those connections. And how we can do that is thinking about um, meeting a stranger on, on the street. I know right now we're not, we're social distancing, but when we have a conversation with one another and how do we teach our children to greet one another? It is an essential skill. How are you? Good morning. It's great to see you. Um, you know, really having, teaching our children to greet one another. It is, it is essential to have a conversation and it is a skill. It doesn't just come naturally. So whether we are talking about children that have been identified or not, this is a lifelong skill that we can teach our children so they can be successful. And how do we teach them to respond to one another in a conversation? How are you doing today? Oh, I'm doing well, how are you? But we have to practice that. We, and we will talk about some conversation starters that can help us with that. And I can give you some tools and a website that can give you some resources. But also, how do we monitor our goals? Right now, I know there's remote learning. Our children are not in an on-site school, so they may be learning virtually. But how can we, as we work together with, with children, um, really monitor, oh, I really like the way you, you, you did that. I really like the way you said that. Um, working on impulse control, like Sue mentioned. I mean, there's a lot of stressors and a lot of um, things that are going on in our children's mind. And so how do we help them? We can monitor that and really celebrate those successes and identify those strengths like Sue mentioned. But also throughout the day, as we are working with our children, whether as a family, whether as a, a teacher, let's, let's check in. What are some highs and lows? Really giving them that space to voice how they're feeling. Very important so they can manage those emotions. And one example is how we can have a conversation starter. Um, there are some tools, Sanford Harmony, as you see here. This is a free tool. It is a website um, and you can, um, sanfordharmony.org. So there's conversation starters, there's activities, there's resources that you could use to help build those connections with our children that will help them find the commonalities with one another. So a great tool um, is Sanford Harmony, and that's one of the uh, many resources that we could use. Right now, um, during COVID, there's also Harmony at Home. So if you are struggling um, with your students, with your children, to help them learn how to build relationships and to start conversation starters, this is, this is one of the many tools that do that. There's also lesson plans. So if you're working on empathy, which will decrease the bullying that Sue mentioned. There's lesson plans on Sanford Harmony as well. 
but it's very important for us to build on those positive relationships. A lot of our children, they're on different developmental levels. Our children are on different um, socio, um, social emotional levels and their intelligence, you know, is measured in different ways, but it is essential for all of our children, for us to identify the importance of having a solid relationship, teaching our children how to talk to one another, how to communicate with one another. Because if you can see here on this study by the Economist Group, is that children with social emotional competencies, that means that an adult is working with a child a few minutes a day, a few minutes a week to, to learn how to communicate with one another and to identify their emotions and help regulate those emotions. And it's important for our families as well to identify, I am stressed, I am tired, whatever it is. Um, but helping our children identify these social emotional competencies and build positive peer relationships, they are two times as likely to be self-sufficient and to not only 13% have higher academic performance, but sustain and have jobs and able to support themselves financially as they become adults. And whether that means college, whether that means entrepreneurs, whether that means um, vocational, but by really teaching these competencies will help promote the career readiness and prepare our children for a successful future. And so just like Sue and I were mentioned, there's many resources that you could use to help build these relationships and to bridge um, a communication, um, bridge communication between the families and the teachers and to help our children with Tourette's. She mentioned the Iris Center, the Peabody, that's a great free resource. Also, the Tourette Association of America, like Sue showed earlier, and you will have, um, you will receive this PowerPoint, great free resources to help to help with our, our children. And I mentioned also Sanford Harmony has great tools to help us um, during COVID and then after when the pandemic is over to help everyone learn how to communicate with one another and have healthy friendships and relationships because that is the key for them to have a successful outcomes after post-secondary education. Anything else, Sue, you'd like to add? No, I, I, do we have questions? We do have questions. Okay. Excellent. All right. Well, thank you so much, Sue and Robin, for such an excellent informative presentation. We're now going to start answering the questions that were submitted. You can continue to submit questions as we answer. We're going to get to as many as we can today, but if we don't get to all the questions, just know we have a full-time information and referral staff at the TAA, and you can reach out to us at support at Tourette.org, and we will make sure that we follow up with answers to your questions. Also, just so you're aware, I downloaded the slide deck for the presentation under the handouts panel of your GoToWebinar panel, so you can access that presentation. All right, so for our first question here, we are moving from primary school to secondary school, where my child will have multiple teachers throughout the day. What are some, some tips for transitioning to this type of learning and working with so many teachers and building staff? I could start with that. I think if, if, if you have an IEP, but if you don't have an IEP, whether or not you do, an individualized education program, you can set up a transition meeting with all of the teachers that your student will be working with and not just the teachers, it could also be if there's a school counselor, school nurse, um, the uh, assistant principal may want to be there. And that's an opportunity for, for the teachers to understand the present uh, complications that Tourette's, that Tourette's or tic disorder might, might, it might impede a, um, a student's learning, this student's learning. And so the other thing is, ask them about well, what are the um, what are the systems in place? For example, m my son from kindergarten on, his teachers, and this was for everybody, they started them with planners, and in the planner was everything that had to happen at, during the day, what time, what homework what assignments were due, and that really started kindergarten all the way through high school. 
And that's, that's one thing that could really help with the transition. You can discuss the behaviors, any therapies that's going on. And once they are aware and, and you develop a nice relationship with them, hopefully teachers and families will, will communicate throughout the year with successes as well as any type of challenges that come up in the class. I hope that answers. Great, thank you. And then our next question here, what are some good strategies to use with a school that may often table or say that they will look at it later and continue that same story when you suggest or try to give Tourette information and resources to them? What are some good steps to work on next for helping to educate the school? That's a great question. And one of the things that you can do, I don't know how old the student is or if this is an elementary, middle or high school, but early on um, when a, a student can advocate for themselves um, and, and tell a teacher what they might need in terms of um, support or a computer or whatever the challenge is, that's the best way because that, that student is in school all the time. The other thing is um, families can be informed and bring their information to the IEP, the Individualized Education Meeting. And even if there isn't one, parents can, um, parents, families can um, ask to set up meetings and, and truly share information with, with sort of um, equal strengths. So the, the, the parents and, and the school are on the same level where one shouldn't be um, more important or have a, a stronger decision-making uh, role than the family. And that's sometimes hard to establish, but that's really important. Great, great. And then you spoke to this a little bit, but just to take it a little bit further, what is your opinion on introducing or providing a presentation to classmates each year about Tourette to help them better understand the condition? I think it's great. I, I really do. I think, you know, that sort of goes with, with what Robin was saying, too, because I, I, I was kind of fascinated. I can re I'll, I'll tell you one story. My son would just, he would see people staring and he would say, oh, that's my Tourette's, that's my Tourette's. And that started pretty early. But but when he was on a swim team and he had both, at the time, verbal and motor tics. And the kids before the, the swim, they all got together and there's probably 20. There was a new one and she, you, you could see that she was kind of staring and w one of the kids just turned around and said, oh yeah, that's Mark, he has Tourette's. And then that was it. So I think that's a wonderful idea. Kids, kids are the best own advocates. And I'm not sure if you know about um, the Tourette's Association trains students to be advocates. And they actually are trained to go out and talk. And um, they travel to Washington, DC and give presentations to their senators and representatives. <clears throat> that's the Junior Ambassador Program, it's fabulous. Great, thank you so much. And yes, for anyone, just to kind of echo off what Sue just said, for anyone who's ever interested in learning more about the Youth Ambassador Program for a student or child of yours, um, you know, feel free to visit our website. And that program is for children ages 12 to 17, children and teenagers ages 12 to 17. And then we also have a Rising Leaders Program for young adults ages 18 to 25. So feel free to always reach out to the TAA with any questions about those programs. And um, we have time for another couple of questions. So. Our next question here is, what do you suggest I should try to help my child initiate conversations to make new friends who don't understand Tourette's syndrome? I don't know how old the child is. And uh, I think one way is, you know, kids have to be taught, like Robin was saying, how to talk to each other. Um, it's not really a natural skill. And so by having sort of um, uh, a list of introductions, and depending on how old, you know, it would be very simple for a younger child, but they could be, um, they could get increasingly more difficult as a, as a student is able to talk more fluently about Tourette's. But it could early on, uh, my name is Mark, I have Tourette's and I do funny things with my voice and hands, but I'm just like you. 
and then, and, and then of course it can be more complicated. And I'll let Robin weigh in because she had mentioned resources for conversation starters that are really helpful. Robin? Yeah, um, that's that's a great it's a great question, and that is very it's very important because it is hard to initiate conversations, and uh, I, that is a very good uh, resource um, to use. Really teaching them, giving them a menu of items. How do you say you know hello? How are you? Uh, my name is Robin. It's great to see you. And then practice role playing with the children, giving them a menu of of options and having them answer some questions, and then really. Like Sue said, it is a skill. So practicing and rehearsing, how do you respond appropriately to various questions? So really using some of the resources, whether it's Sanford Harmony or any other um, conversation starters that you have or icebreakers, but really just practicing that with the children, giving them, it's a great idea, what Sue said, giving them almost a script of what they say, but really just, just practicing with the children, what is appropriate, what's not appropriate, giving them different scenarios, but really by helping them, um, giving them some some initiate some some starters having some conversation starters is a great beginning to initiate that conversation then you can keep on practicing and learn how to sustain and continue to engage in a conversation great great thank you both so much and we have time for one more question here um this is kind of a two-tiered question what is the best way to keep parents informed about what is going on in the classroom and also how often should educators be communicating with the parents well, I, I would say one of the best ways is is um, a, a little newsletter, but there's also websites. The problem with websites, uh, are you could have a classroom website, but not everybody um, is it, it has uh, access to technology. So a simple newsletter, and this is for honestly from from early elementary all the way through high school. What's going on in school? Uh, what's coming ahead, the calendars, that way that helps the family, uh, oh, this, oh, testing is coming, this could be stressful. But also the fun things that they're planning, the strengths, um, little blurbs about uh, great things that each student in the class was able to do or funny things, successes. And, and I mean, weekly would be ridiculous, but monthly would certainly be reasonable. And, and maintain an open door policy as well. Robin? And I would say, yes, and I would um, add to that to say, it, that to the second question, what is the, um, you know, how often should you communicate? I really, like she mentioned, a monthly newsletter is great. Um, as much communication as you can. If it's a log that goes back and forth um, between the teachers and the parents and they just initial it or stamp it, I mean, once again, depending on the age level. But I believe if you have that open door policy, like Sue said, between the families and the teacher, there's no time limit. You can text me at five in the evening. I mean, obviously have your boundaries. You have to protect your, your time as an educator, but really just having that open door policy that if you just need to vent, um, the teacher's here for the family. If you have a question, if you need a strategy, if you need a resource, um, or just anything, if you really build that solid relationship with the parent and the teacher, and I know there's many therapists involved, it can be very overwhelming, but having the, the general education teacher as being the almost the hub and managing all of the relationships, so to speak, but really having that open door policy um, really will help build the connections so the child can get all of the resources that he or she is um, should have and to help them be successful. Great, great, thank you so much. Sue, do you mind just transitioning us to the final slide? No, I didn't realize, okay, great. Thank you so much. Thank you again so much to Sue and Robin for such a wonderful presentation. If there were any questions you're unable to get to, please feel free to uh, submit those questions to support at Tourette.org and we will follow up with you. Um, that's all the time that we have today, but once the session is closed, you will receive a survey on the presentation and we will greatly appreciate if you could complete that and provide your feedback. You will also receive a follow-up email within 24 to 48 hours that will have a link to view a recording of the session and we will be uploading the session to our YouTube channel within the week. We encourage you to reach out to us and provide all of your feedback, questions, suggestions, and ideas for this virtual conference. This is our first time doing this. We were so excited to offer this to you free of charge, thanks to our donors. 
But if you appreciated this session and you'd like to see more programming like this, please, please, we welcome you to support the organization. Now more than ever, um, you can visit us at Tourette.org to learn more and to donate. And on behalf of the TAA, we thank you again for joining us and for taking the time to be here today. And thank you again, Sue and Robin. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Have a great day, everyone. Have a great day. Bye. Bye.